You always hear about the big idea people on the right, but what about on the left? Who's making a difference? Who's the thought leader? Oh, I got the guy for you. And he's going to weigh in on why Trump has to be stopped, why the Democrats are the obvious choice, and what happens if the election goes the other way at home and in the riddle of the Middle East. I'm Chris Cuomo. Welcome to another edition of the Chris Cuomo Project. This is about being a critical thinker, a free agent, where you need food for thought. You don't have to love the menu, but you do need the nutrition and deciding what is right for you to believe and on what basis. All right, enough with the food metaphors. Thank you for subscribing and following here and at News Nation, where I am currently on weekday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern and 11 p. Eastern. Also on Substack, if you go to the chriscuomoproject.substack.com, you can get us ad-free and you can join part of the long COVID conversation that we're having there. Looked at through the lens of my treatment, trying to get past my symptoms of long COVID, all right? So check that out. If you want to wear your independence, and I hope you are learning that the parties are the problem, you can go and get free agent gear and wear your independence. All right, so Mehdi Hassan was at MSNBC. I didn't like the circumstances under which he left. He's decided to move on and start an amazing opportunity for him called Zeteo, Z-E-T-E-O. It's a Greek word. Many's not Greek, I know. But the word is, and it means to seek intellectually, curiosity. And he's starting his own independent media outlet. And I know it has not been easy for people on the left to make it. Why? The left ideologically is not as much of a collective. I know many people on the right want to believe that, but I think that that is projection. You want that to be true uh, because it's what you crave in yourselves is that cohesiveness that is an advantage on the right. The right always says the left sticks together. Again, I think that that's a, a nonsense device. And I think the proof of it is often seen in the punditry. People make it on the right all the time. You got Ben Shapiro, Megyn Kelly. You don't have anything like that on the left, where someone just shouts at people for a living and gets a huge following online. But Mehdi Hassan, I believe, is different. And I wanted to talk to him about the state of play in politics, and why we are where we are, and why he feels about Trump the way he does, and what he sees as the stakes here and abroad. Mehdi Hassan. Mehdi, congratulations on the new you, the new evolution, the new iteration. How do you feel about the transition? What have you decided about how to process the exit from MSNBC? What does it mean to you? And the transition. Feels good. I mean, it does feel good to be free and independent and uh, liberated in many ways. That's not that I'm ungrateful to the opportunities I've had in corporate media and international media. I'm someone for the benefit of your listeners who don't know my background. I, I grew up in the UK. I worked in the UK media for the first 15 years of my career. I worked for Sky News, for the BBC, for some of the big media organizations in the UK. I worked for HuffPost. I worked for Al Jazeera English. Uh, the Global Channel. And in the US, I worked for The Intercept and, of course, for NBC News, for NBC Universal before leaving in January. So I've worked for a bunch of big media organizations on both sides of the Atlantic. I learned a lot, worked with great people. I still have a lot of respect for a lot of those organizations. I'm not one of these people who says, burn it all down. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it is great in this moment that we're in, Chris, which is a pretty major historical moment in terms of election year, in terms of the bloodshed in Gaza, in terms of everything that's happening in our global politics, geopolitics. It's good for someone like me who's always had a big mouth, always been quite opinionated and outspoken, uh, to be my own boss and uh, sail my own ship and decide my own destiny, whatever cliche we want to use. <laughs> Uh, Zeteo is what Mehdi's talking about. If you look it up, it's a Greek word. Uh, really, it's such a great example of what Mehdi's mind is about. Uh, it is a Greek word that means to seek, to find, but it's of an intellectual curiosity of a nature. It's not like, you know, to, to look for a certain mushroom in the grass. It's about <laughs> ideas and intellectualism. And so is Mehdi. Mehdi, as people process the transition, what is your narrative on the exit from MSNBC? And you know, this is coming from me. Uh, yes. I, I am not a 
uh, muckraker. I am not a drama guy, and I don't love the salacious or the gotchas. But if people want to know the background, I feel it's best heard from the source. Yes. Why did you leave? What was the exit? What does it mean to you? So in terms of the background, the background is that NBC canceled my shows. I had two shows for the one on Peacock on the streaming network and one on cable on Sunday nights. Both did very well. The Peacock show did very well online as a social uh, production. And the cable show for Sunday nights, Chris, which you know is a graveyard slot on cable, did pretty well in that time slot. Um, but what many just said is true. Uh, we looked out. The, uh, we looked at the reach and the ratings. There is no good statistical argument that yep. Medi was failing, so they got rid of him, which was out there in the media. Yeah, an about anonymous what source told the Post that it was a ratings issue, um, which is BS. Uh, the end of November, shows are cancelled. Um, and I was offered the post, this is all public information, I was offered the title of a guest anchor and uh, political analyst on air. Um, and I thought about it, and pretty quickly, Chris, uh, it wasn't really a hard decision to say, this is not for me, this is not what I want to spend. 2024, which I consider to be one of the biggest years of our lifetimes in terms of news, impact, politics. Um, you know, I love sitting in for Chris and for Alex and for Lawrence and the primetime guys. It's a great opportunity, great privilege to speak to that audience. But that isn't really what I wanted to spend my year doing. So it was a bit of a no-brainer to speak to my wife and uh, talk to people I trust and say, look, I'm just going to try and find a way out of MSNBC. And MSNBC, to be fair to them, uh, oh, you know, allowed me to negotiate an exit, which let me leave pretty quick. I did my last show on, I think, January the 7th, where I announced I was leaving and then had a few weeks uh, in between and then launched uh, the new setup. Piers Morgan asked me this the other day, like, why do they cancel shows? People keep asking me this. I, honestly, you would have to ask MSNBC. I was never told why. You didn't ask? Of course I asked. And what'd they say? No, no, no reason given that I understand. Do you think that you were advancing ideas and agendas that MSNBC doesn't want to own? It's a big question. Again, what MSNBC wants or doesn't want, you have to ask MSNBC. I've always advanced ideas and agendas that people are uncomfortable with, and that's been the case throughout my career. I I've always been a bit of a you know round peg in a square hole, both in corporate media, print media, etc. Just because I'm a bit different to most people, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that I was pretty different to most of the anchors at MSNBC. Uh, I've been pretty different to most of the people in quote unquote mainstream media for a while now. I, I'm proud of that. Uh, I come from a very different background. There's not many people at MSNBC hosting MSNBC who have my background either ideologically, uh, uh, you know, in terms of nationality, does it, you know, multiple journeys that I've been on. Uh, I moved to the US in 2015. I became a citizen in 2020. Uh, my politics are the, to the left of most people in cable. Um, I am a Muslim uh, who's quite outspoken on issues related to Muslims, Islam, the Middle East, foreign policy. So, and I'm not someone who plays the game, Chris. I mean, this is something I've talked about openly. There is a there is a media game uh, which which requires certain norms and conventions, and I, I've adhered to some of them, uh, but others not so much. And you know, whether it comes to my interviewing style, whether it comes to how I interact with people in power. Um, you know, I'm somebody who does. I'm somebody who likes to try and do tough interviews with most people. Obviously, there's certain people. It's hard to do a tough interview. Maybe you agree with everything they say, but even then, I try and be a devil's advocate and say, "This is what your critics say." Uh, I was just interviewing the South African foreign minister. I support the South African foreign minister's, uh, the South African government's petition at the ICJ accusing Israel of genocide. That doesn't mean I didn't put criticism to the South African foreign minister from Israel, from South Africa's critics. So I've always been someone who tries to be tough on everyone, tries to speak right. my mind, don't worry about access issues. And, you know, obviously that doesn't fit with everyone. South Africa wasn't the perfect messenger. I get why it seemed clever uh, at the time. There I is also, no perfect messenger. True, Chris. true. I also don't think it is genocide. I also don't think it matters uh, because whatever is happening, however you define it, it's too much and it needs yeah, to stop. I, I, I agree and disagree with what you just said. So Mehdi has a book over his uh, shoulder called Win Every Argument, uh, which I have. And it is a really interesting uh, book about really rhetoric, about how to understand argumentation, how to argue. Mehdi is a master and champion debater uh, and he's very good at it on TV. Here's my supposition for you. I believe that you have a chance of being um, a unicorn, which is someone on the left that can gather a following in digital media. It's very easy for people on the right. 
Yes. They're a much more cohesive group. You guys on the left are much more cats I, to I their agree. doggy mentality in terms of being a pack animal. I think you can do it. Uh, and inshallah. I wish you, and I wish you well, inshallah. Um, but is it a fair criticism that the problem with you people on the left is that you win a lot of arguments? You just don't win over people's hearts and minds to your side. You're very smart and very clever and adept. You just don't get where America is coming from. And that's why you have all you can handle in the form of one of the most flawed candidates in political history in Donald Trump. I 100% agree with everything you just said. In fact, chapter two of my book is about that very premise. The idea that you have to be able to win people over with their heart and not just their minds. You have to be able to offer emotional arguments and not just logical, rational arguments. And it has killed me, Chris, for 20, 25 years, as long as I've been covering politics as a journalist in the UK and in the US. This is not a US phenomenon. This is a global uh, left liberal issue, whether it's the Labour Party in the UK, whether it's the Democratic Party in the US. Wherever you are, you do have a set of kind of technocratic managerial politicians who rise to the top of these liberal parties and then think that they can, uh, you know, uh, uh, factually get their way to power. They can, you know, you, you see liberal parties always, I'll give you one more Pew poll. I'll give you one more peer reviewed paper, uh, one more statistic. And that's just not how people's, uh, that's just not how people operate. It's just not how human beings uh, accept uh, evidence, arguments, uh, are persuaded. And I think what the right has so successfully done over the years, and Donald Trump is a master of this in his own dark and evil way, is play to people's base emotions. The right does it with the worst emotions, in my view. Anger, fear, hate, you know, uh, uh, concern about the other. And what I say to liberals and leftists is you have to do the same thing, obviously not with dark emotions, but appeal to people's better angels, to, you know, solidarity, hope, community, inspire people with collective action tell a story. Like the idea of telling a story is such a basic thing. Think about 2016. Donald Trump says, build a wall, ban Muslims. We all still remember it. It's very, very Islam simple. Islam hates us, he it's said. Like, it's, all, it's very, very uh, evocative, provocative. We all, I literally can tell you his 2016 platform right now, eight years later. Can you tell me Hillary Clinton's? I'm sure she had a great childcare policy, much better than Trump's. I'm sure it had 16 different sections. Great. But that's just not how you win people over by throwing policy papers at them or, you know, hurling facts and figures. And I try, that doesn't mean you give up on facts and figures. Let me just be very clear so people don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you go down the alternative facts route of Kellyanne Conway. I'm saying that in order to win people over, as you say, to see where Americans are, you have to be able to give them a factual proposal. You have to give them facts and figures, but you have to really, really connect with them at a very visceral, emotive level. So... How is it that not only are uh, or is the left not overwhelming the right, but is now defined by many on the right as the darkness? Uh, <laughs> you want to destroy, uh, the, the, you want to replace the white man. You can't find white people in commercials anymore. Uh, and all of the other tropes and fears and phobias that it's the left that is yeah. about the darkness. They don't want, they want to destroy everything. Sexuality, uh, now our institutions, you guys prosecute all your political opponents. Look what you're doing to poor Trump. 90 different indictment counts, gazillions of dollars in fines, deep state. These are all left vehicles now. I grew up with them as right vehicles. Yeah. What happened? Well, I think that the right has done two things very successfully. One is uh, owning the libs has become the mantra. It, there is no real idea. What is the modern conservative movement? Is it about low taxes? Is it about strong defense? Is it even about tough borders as they claim? You know, if you think about Ronald Reagan or whoever it is, even George W. Bush, there is some kind of ideological platform that we understand. For me, one of the most telling moments in modern conservative history, Republican Party history, is the 2020 platform when the Republican Party, the RNC says, we have no platform. We just support Donald Trump. Is there ever more telling... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, when people say, oh, you can't call it a cult, it's literally a cult. The RNC said so in August 2020, where they said we've got no platform. So this idea that there's no, it doesn't stand for anything, there is no modern conservative movement, and therefore it only stands for owning the libs in the most vicious, 
the most insulting, the most immature way. And by the way, not just the lips. Do you remember when uh, Mitch McConnell fell? And he mm-hmm. fell some steps. And you had people like, what's her name? Jenna, what's the name of Trump's lawyer? Jenna, Ellis. I'm having a mind block. Remember Jenna Ellis? Ellis. Jenna Ellis and others just mocking him. on so like, I don't like Mitch McConnell, but I'm not going to mock an old man who falls down some stairs. Like, this is what it's reduced to. It's the most kind of pathetic, childish, immature, uh, venal, vicious approach to politics. And that includes obviously the left. And we're seeing that with the rhetoric now. The left, are, the left aren't just left. They're communists. They're Marxists. They're cultural Marxists. All this BS. Joe Biden's a communist. Don't make me laugh. Um, so this kind of nonsense that we have. And then the other point is this, is that it's a very, very calculated form of projection, Chris. What they're saying, they're often describing themselves. You know, I, have, I, I often use the hashtag on social media, every accusation is a confession. A lot of what they say is what they're doing. So when they're saying Hunter Biden is really, really corrupt, it's because they saw four years of Trump and his family milking it. Uh, When they say now, for example, if you notice, Chris, that Donald Trump now talks about democracy a lot. Yeah. Because for four years, finally, the liberals got their act together, had a coherent argument that the Republican Party is an existential threat to American democracy, is engaged in the voter suppression, tried to overturn an election, doesn't believe in our democratic institutions. And now their only response is, say, well, Biden doesn't believe in democracy. And, you know, this is, this is a president who spent four years threatening to lock up his opponents, demanding the DOJ go after his opponents. People have such short memories, Chris. Do you remember the, uh, the image Trump posted once of all these political figures, including his own deputy attorney general, Rosa, behind bars? Yes. Right? Random people were behind bars. Yes. That guy is now saying, oh, you're weaponizing the government to go after me. So it's all projection. And they are masters of projection. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from Z-Biotics. You want to wake up feeling fresh, right? Even after a night of doing all the no-nos, that's where Z-Biotics comes in. A pre-alcoholic probiotic drink. Genetically engineered, all right? Invented by PhD scientists to tackle those rough mornings after partying, drinking, you know the game. Here's how it works. What does alcohol do when you're drinking? It gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. The byproduct, not just dehydration, is what's to blame for the rough next day. Z-Biotics produces an enzyme to break the byproduct down. Just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night to set yourself up for success the morning after. I know it from when I was drinking, and I know it from people who are still drinking. It is better to prepare than to take it on after the fact the next day. Go to zbiotics.com slash Chris and you'll get 15% off your first order. You use Chris at the checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't feel like it did what it was supposed to do, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. zbiotics.com slash Chris. Use the code Chris at checkout for 15% off. And I thank Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and your good times. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from Delete Me. Boy, am I the right person to pitch this product. Delete Me is for those of us who are tired of the online harassment. What does it do? Delete Me finds and removes your personal information that you don't want online. It's a subscription service. And when you sign up, it goes and it searches all the big databases and find information on you that could lead to ID theft, doxing, phishing scams. Sign up and provide Delete Me with exactly what information you want deleted and their experts take it from there. It's not a one-time service. It's always working for you and it has to be that way. It requires constant monitoring and removing of personal information that you don't want on the internet. So take control of your data, keep your private life private, sign up for Delete Me. Now, you can get a special discount for listeners and viewers. Today, 20% off. Go to joindeleteme.com slash Cuomo. Use the promo code Cuomo at checkout. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeleteme.com slash Cuomo. Joindeleteme.com slash Cuomo. And enter the code Cuomo at checkout. Let me spell it. J-O-I-N-D-E-L-E-T-E-M-E dot com. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from Sundays. This fresh dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients works. 
Sundays was founded, co-founded, by Dr. Tori Waxman, a practicing vet who tests and formulates every version of each recipe. I wonder if they eat it themselves. I hope not. Anyway, my dogs on video will show you how they savage this food. And I have already been changing up the food to get more sustainable types of food. But here's what I love about this, okay? This is delivered as kibble. And let me tell you something. It is a game changer because my fridge is not stuffed with dog food Chinese entree trays where, you know, I'm worried that my son is gonna grab one and eat it up one night thinking it's meatloaf and it may be human grade, but I don't want my kid eating it, you know what I mean? So the beautiful thing about this is it's easier to store. It's easier to feed. And I know the ingredients are right and my dogs love it. And I know it's better for them. So. You want to get 40% off your first order of Sundays? Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash Chris or use the code Chris at checkout. So one of the sticks I've been beaten with uh, recently is that <laughs> I um, underestimate dangerously the dangerousness of Donald Trump. Uh, my suggestion is pretty simple. I'm not going to argue that he doesn't say what he says. Uh, I'm going to argue that it doesn't mean what it would if you said it. Uh, because this man is a lie machine, an a hyperbole machine. And you have to look at it that way. That the idea that he's a man of great vision and strategy who wants to become an autocrat and is going to put people around him who can help him overthrow America's democracy... I think is a laughably absurd notion. Mm. And the more the left insists on it, the more it makes people think okay. who are in the center, right? That small group that you guys are exaggerating the problem because you don't have better ideas. So a couple of things. I'll engage in the substance of what you said in a moment, but let me just question your premise that this is a left critique. This, I know, Chris, I get it where you're coming from. You have this kind of stick, like you're in the center. There's a right and there's a left and you're above the fray. That, first, first of all, that's not true. But where does this left come from? Some of the most eloquent, passionate, and most informed critics of Donald Trump's fascism and assault on democracy are not leftists. It's true. Judge Michael Lutig is not a leftist. Liz Cheney, last time I checked, is not a leftist. True. George Conway is not a leftist. True. All of the former Trump administration officials who've said, the man's crazy, he's authoritarian. General John not Kelly. not leftists, right? So they're not leftists. Let's I don't accept the premise that this is a leftist critique, not at all. Uh, in fact, there are people on the left who attack people like me and say you're being hyperbolic and agree with the, the premise of your statement. So it's not a left thing. Let's just put that to one side. In terms of the substance, number one, let me snarkily say this. Chris, did you think Donald Trump would incite an insurrection and refuse to leave office in 2019, in 2020? Uh, no, but I also wouldn't characterize the behavior the way you did. You don't think he incited an insurrection? No. I or don't do think, think it was did? an insurrection. I think it was a riot. Okay, did you, okay, I, I don't agree with that for a second, but let's pop that for a moment. Did you in 2019 or 2020 say Donald Trump will refuse to leave office and incite a riot and an attack on the Capitol? No. I did. In 2019, I wrote a piece for The Intercept saying Donald Trump is very clear about the fact that he won't accept the election result and he won't leave and people are ignoring this danger. And if this, you know what's going to happen? Violence and rioting. I wrote this in The Intercept in, I think, May of 2019, about 18 months before the election. People said to me, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a brick. You don't understand American politics. The Secret Service will walk him out. Uh, you, there's no danger here. This is all hyperbole. So my first point, Chris, is forgive me when I hear people say it's hyperbole. I was right then and they were wrong. So maybe we should have a little bit of humility from the folks who say, calm down. A lot of the calm down folks were completely wrong on January the 6th, 2021. That's my first point. And then in terms of the substance, I mean, he is saying this stuff. I, right. I agree with you, Chris. He's a liar. He's an exaggerator. He, I, you know, I, I completely agree. He's not a strategist. I don't think you need to be a strategist to be an autocrat, right? I don't think you need that. I think you have kind of autocratic tendencies and instincts, and then it's an issue of whether those around you and the but institutions- they usually have a plan, Mehdi, as we both well, know. Well, he's got people around him. Have you read the Heritage Foundation 2025 report? It's a pretty clear plan for authoritarianism. Pretty well laid out over multiple pages. But just go back to Trump. Okay, when I say, so a friend of mine said recently, a friend of mine who doesn't want to vote for Biden because of Gaza, 
So I can't vote for Biden. I said, well, what happens when Trump's president? And they said, well, you know, we'll protest Trump just like we protested him the first time. We but how do you vote for step. Trump if you don't like Biden's position on no, no, the No, no, they didn't say they would vote for him. They said, well, we'll vote for oh, Biden, oh, but they you, don't care you. if Trump wins. They're so you, mad you. at Biden. I got you, I got They you. don't care if Trump wins. And I, I said, well, what are you going to do once Trump's president? You're Muslim, you're going to suffer. We'll protest. We, we protested the first time. I said, what happens when he puts the military on the streets and they open fire on protesters? Oh, Mary, you're just, you're being exaggerating. That's too far. Mark Esper, Chris, a man you know better than I do. Yeah. Just went on MSNBC last week and said, he told me to shoot protesters. I said, we can't do it. Mark Esper won't be there next time. Next time it'll be Cash Patel or General Michael Flynn. who will say, sure, boss, whatever you want. So when you tell me like it's hyperbole exaggeration, it's not. He's already said it. He already gave the order to shoot people. We just got lucky first time around that there were a few half-spined conservatives in his administration who said, no, they won't be there next time, Chris. It'll be Michael Davis. It'll be Michael Flynn. It'll be Cash Patel. It'll be Sebastian Gorka, who will love it. So you really believe if Donald Trump wins again, there's um, all kinds of mayhem and he is doing everything he can, not just to settle scores, but to turn himself as closely as he can as, into Putin. Yes. Why would I not believe that? Every, every bit of evidence we have, public and private, suggests that is his plan. Because the institutions the are too strong. Around. And the rest Say of again? The, because the institutions are too strong, and because the oh the uh, institutions the are branches a joke of in this government country. are too strong. Which institutions? Is this the Supreme Court that's now running down the clock on his behalf, so that he never faces a single federal trial before the next election? Which in any other country would be laughed at. Chris, let me just bring you the immigrant perspective here. The rest of the world thinks we are a joke when it comes to our institutions. In Brazil, Bolsonaro didn't incite an insurrection. He simply questioned the results. The Brazilian judges banned him from running for president again until 2030. We have judges in this country who, by the way, are appointed by the president. Absurd system. No other country does it this way. They have independent judges, not party-nominated judges. Our judges, three of whom were appointed by Trump, are now running down the clock on his behalf. This ludicrous decision to hear his immunity case at their own slow pace. So no, I don't believe the institutional front. I believe we dodged it in January of 2021. Uh, by the skin of our teeth, by people like Raffensperger happening to be in the right place at the right time, by the Supreme Court in that moment realizing that none of the 60 cases, including the Pennsylvania case, were worth hearing. Next time around, it's a different ballgame. You've seen the Republican Party, what they've been up to in recent years. They've purged any of those folks from 2020. Raffensperger, thankfully, did just get reelected in Georgia. They weren't able to get rid of him. But in other places in Michigan, they've carried out purges. And this time around, yeah, they're much better to take on our, our institutions. Which institution? The House? Chris, the Republican Party in Congress is a Trump party. You know this. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been to date. Uh, there are different ways to look at it. Um, it's certainly as a matter of degree. How so? Well, when you, if you he, listen to, to General Kelly, now, do I wish he had been saying these things while he was chief of staff? Abso absolutely. But even with a pretty weak, okay, uh, Esper, I, I would put it the stronger scale uh, of this, although he made the decision to work for Trump, he had that good explanation of, I knew this guy was going to have to need good people around him. Because, yeah. All right, I'll give it to him. But uh, th that could break either way. You know, out Agreed. of conscience, you could also say, no, I won't work with this guy. And let me tell you why. Um, but that with a pretty weak lineup around him, there was a lot of pushback. And the theory from even John Kelly is the stronger people are around him, uh, if you had regular people who were around other White Houses that he had interfaced with, they would have been a much bigger check. So even with these weak people, people were telling him no all the time. And he listened to them because as long as it's good for him somehow at the end of the day, he goes along with it. He doesn't he doesn't have what most people who want you to shoot at protesters have in their heads about why. And that for him, it's really that he wants to win. He wants to stall these lawsuits. And Agreed. it's basically uh, the uh, end of it. Uh, the, the, here's where we agree, is that he, the one saving grace we have with Trump as the autocrat in waiting is that he doesn't have an underlying ideology of any right. kind. He's not Orban, Putin, Erdogan, MBS, Modi, in that shape he wants or to form, be liked. right? He he wants to. I mean, he wants to save his 
save his ass right now, right? In terms of the legal and situation. Be liked. He, pointed at. he wants to be well, liked, Mehdi. If, well, you, were to, if well, you were to go we on TV well, tonight and say, you know- He's not running a campaign. He's not running a campaign that implies he wants to be liked at all. He's running a base campaign. He wants to be liked by his base. He's given up on any kind of- In 2016, he was reaching out to independents, trying to pretend to be anti-establishment candidate workers. Not now. But He's but, not even trying. But Mehdi, he has a pathology involved in his behavior. Yes. I can use that word with you. That yes. most politicians don't. He ha- He is a an actual- a moral agent, as somebody who yes. has studied philosophy for 35 years. He's of my also life. a malignant narcissist, and you mentioned pathology, Chris. Here's another. Sorry to do another kind of "I told you so" moment. <laughs> Back in 2018-19, um, Dr. Bandy Lee of Yale put out a book right. called "The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump." A bunch of psychiatrists analyzed it yeah. from different angles. I pushed that book heavily. I had her on my podcast at, at The Intercept. I went and spoke at a conference she organized. People said to me, this is crazy. This is a left gone over the cliff, like trying to psychoanalyze the president. This violates all sorts of uh, medical rules. Guess what? John Kelly, who you just mentioned, right. he bought the book. The guy in the White House who was chief of staff yeah, was I know. using the book as a guide to his boss. Oh, look, I right? do so think again, it's weird for clinicians to want to analyze somebody that they, they haven't met. It is weird, but, but it's a unique, you know, we live in a case of lots of unprecedented moments thanks to Trump. And he's but a pretty obvious narcissist. to come back to your point on, on the yes man and the no man, yes. I'm not denying that there were people who said no around it. They didn't say no enough, like you just pointed out. They didn't resign and say their piece at the time. And by the way, even with those adults in the room, he still almost started a nuclear war with North Korea. He still almost started a war with Iran. He still kidnapped children at the border. He still praised neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. He still allowed a half a million Americans to die who probably many of them didn't need to die from COVID. So even with that, he was a disastrous, perhaps the most disastrous president of our uh, in modern American history. I'm saying next time around, Chris, there aren't going to be those people. He is coming back with vengeance. Four years is a long time. He's not the same Trump as term one. He is going to come back much angrier, much more organized, and surrounded by way more yes men and open fascists like the Bannons of this world than he did last time around. I'll give you an example, Chris, just one example. Mike Davis, who Don Jr. is touting as future AG or future senior figure in the administration, conservative lawyer, used to be a Bush guy, gone full MAGA. This guy is on Twitter saying, I'm going to deport Mehdi Hassan to Guantanamo Bay, right? Now, he doesn't have the power to do that even as attorney general. But that, those are the kind of people that he wants to, he and his people want to bring into the administration. It is not Jeff Sessions, as bad as Jeff Sessions was. He was still a conventional conservative. Mm. I understand. I understand the concern. Um, I don't believe it. And now you could say, well, you're being delusional. I don't think so. I just think that I'm being, I'm being swayed by my very long time knowledge of him. Uh, so what and, do you think is going to happen, Chris? I've laid out my vision. What do you think is going to happen from 24? Well, uh, first of all, I'm not sure. Onwards, he's president. I'm not sure that he wins. No, no, let's assume he wins. What all does right, he do? So if he wins, um, well, one, does the left create any dynamic like the one we had after the last election? Um, I don't know. Not that it would be baseless, but is Donald Trump, are the people around him capable of rigging 100%, they're capable of it. So what if we get real proof that he rigged the election and that's why he won? Um, I think he's much more likely to rig an election than it is likely that it would be rigged against him. So I got to see what happens with that. Then if he wins, uh, I believe that that is so much of what the satisfaction was for him that he may coast from silly media fight to media fight, and he will do a lot of saber rattling against us. I think that will be his main focus because the Democrats will all fall in line like every out party does. Unfortunately, what do you think, I said two questions, what do you think happens to all these freaks around him, the heritage folks, the ideologues, the Bannon? Do you think they just- You know, he has You don't think they have, well, you don't think they have real clear plans on on the social- liberal culture wars front on he the is not Democratic a heritage front. he's not a heritage foundation guy um, but they're the ones who are going to be they're the ones pushing they are pushing whatever kind of agenda things. you want to call Talking they about were very effective with the civil judges. servants yes deep state stuff as they call it which i don't believe in by the way um bureaucracies definitely have their entrenched issues uh, but i don't believe in what is called deep state uh, i believe it's a false 
but, turn, uh, but, negative. But, but it's projection, right, Chris? They want it to be a deep state that they can then weaponize. He, you know, the, the stuff they say about Biden runs the FBI, Biden has nothing to do with the FBI. That's what Trump wants. We know that. You and I both know he would love to have an FBI. Right. I think that's a little bit too clever for them. I think go that, after his opponent. You don't think Donald Trump wants to have an IRS no, no, chief no, and FBI chief that, go after his enemies? I think that he absolutely likes the idea of power so he can abuse it. I think we have every bit so of evidence. So that's my question to you, Chris. Where are the abuses of power that you are worried about? You're saying you don't think, you think I'm behind the one. What, you must be concerned about some abuses of power under Trump. What are they? I guess that I have been reserving judgment because I don't think he's going to win. He could win. Okay. He could win. And the polling Definitely. now 50, 50. has been bad 50, 50. longer than I expected it to be. Okay? Agreed. Um, but you. I did not expect a non-campaign from the sitting president either. And I Agreed. did not expect him to not take any action on the border when it clearly has become the dominant domestic issue. I did but not he has expect tried that. to take action, not action I agree with, but the Republicans screwed him for party um, political well, reasons. Well, they screwed him on that Senate bill. Um, yes, and we know it because they said it out loud. All right. Which to me would have been the biggest shock in recent history to hear that out loud that way. I've never heard that before. Uh, second, I wasn't shocked. Um, he could take issue, though. He could he could take issue right now with his own executive action. And would he be challenged in the courts? Uh, potentially depends on what they architect. But even still, it would move the needle in his favor because he'd be trying at least. But I don't know why they're playing it that way. So that aside, I don't know what to fear of Donald Trump. And I know that many people say, but Chris, that's enough. That you don't know, but you know that he's going to do something. That's enough. He has to lose. And I say, okay, then beat him. I'm worried about the lawsuits because it looks like from the outside or from the person who's not as invested in the minutia as everyone who covers it, it does look like they're out to get him. That a lot of these cases, a lot of the counts I, seem we, we've a little We've been talking weak. for about half an hour. This is the moment I've disagreed with you the most. Please, I love it. it I'm, of, I'm of the exact opposite view. I, would, I am tearing my hair out at Merrick Garland, wishing we had an AG who was out to get Donald Trump. Instead, we had an AG who slow walked the entire damn thing, was way too cautious and small-c conservative. He should have put an Elizabeth Warren in there. He should have put a Rottweiler into DOJ Biden. Instead, he appoints this kind of centrist Republican, uh, you know, let's all be kumbaya friends type, who doesn't want to mention the Trump name, who wants to kind of avoid anything Trump-related, as we know from a lot of the Washington Post reporting. And now we're finding out that the Southern District of New York has screwed over the Manhattan case. Again, many questions for Garland. So no, again, it's projection. When I hear, and also when I hear Trump and the Republicans say, Garland's out to get us, Garland, this is a campaign, a witch hunt. I'm like, if only, I think I say, if only, if only they were out to get him, if only they were single-minded in their pursuit of this guy who tried to overturn our government. It wasn't just a riot, as you suggested. So no, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know what it looks like to certain swing voters, but to me, who's been following this for years, tearing my hair out, wondering why they haven't taken more action, why Liz Cheney did more to hold Donald Trump to account than the Democratic Attorney General. Yeah, it's, it's the, I come from an exact opposite position. By the way, quick thing before I forget, it's been in my head for a bit. Do you believe in 2028, President Donald Trump just says, it's been great, see you later, guys. I'm off to play golf. Maybe with a strong suggestion that uh, the next one should be one of his kids. Interesting. That's an interesting point. God, God help us all. You know, I'm, uh, much, more, I'm much more about understanding the present than I am about any kind of sense of prognostication. Because to me, I reject the idea that it's a cult. I reject the idea that- You reject the idea that the GOP is a cult? Yes, I wow. reject the idea. I, I think it's all about the two-party game and it's all zero sum and they want to win and that that is the only goal in two-party no. politics is to win. Then, then and they wouldn't nominate Donald Trump. He, he is the best said, he's, chance he's to the, win. No, Nobody does no, better. Chris. Chris, if they wanted to win, Nikki Haley would be the candidate right now. She'd walk, she'd, all the polls suggest she wipes Joe Biden off the board. Why yes. would you nominate the guy who lost in 22, 2020 and 2018? Why would they nominate him? If they, didn't, if they didn't fear what happens if they don't. Yeah, fear, they fear what happens to themselves because he runs a personality cult and he runs a mob-style movement. Some of these people fear for their own lives, Chris. This is the America we live in today. Political right? lives. As, they fear as as he's going to no, no, primary no, no. them and They fear for their win. safety and their family's safety, right? Unless Mitt Romney's lied. Mitt Romney has gone on the record and said, 
that members of Congress told him they couldn't vote for impeachment because they were worried that their children would be attacked. Their right. wives were getting death threats. Multiple House members have quit. That is America in 2021. Never happened in my lifetime. I believe in your lifetime where people are having to quit politics because their own supporters might kill them or hurt them because they go against a great dear leader, the orange man. So no, I think it is a cult. And that's the only way you can explain how, I'm not, I'm not saying everyone's in the cult, Chris. Clearly there are cynical members. There are people trying to get ahead in life. There are people who have, you know, put their, you know, J.D. Vance is not in a cult. We know that J.D. Vance thinks Donald Trump is Hitler. We know that because he said so. We know that J.D. Vance backs hit tr uh, Trump because it's- Expedience. He, it's expediency. He could get the vice presidency and boost his career. He shouldn't be anywhere near a high office. So those people put to one side, but in general, the kind of the freak show in Congress, uh, the people out there in the base who worship Trump, who, you know, you've, you've seen, you've seen the clips and you've seen the polls and you've seen the focus groups that they will believe anything he says, that they will oppose anything. I don't need he any says. of them. I live in a place that he won. And a lot of the people who are they're in, all rational actors? Who are in my life, like that I fish with and that, you know. They're, my, and they're rational actors? They, they are rational come actors, small businessmen, almost exclusively some first responders. And they are not under the sway of Trump except for one thing. And this is what I don't understand why it isn't more of a motivational tool on the left. Go on. They are so, dis I, I've learned two things. One, why do they dismiss his obvious flaws as someone they wouldn't want in their house, on their yes. boat, or anything? Because they believe two things. One, it takes that kind of guy to deal with this kind of dirty system. And two, Agreed. they're all kind of like him. Enough so they don't get to judge Trump and tell these people, leads me to the second point. They are so outraged, hurt, disappointed, put in the pejorative uh, that yeah. goes to emotional uh, letdown, that you don't get to tell me that Trump isn't worthy when I find you unworthy. And everything is so stilted against me, culturally, uh, endemically, systemically. You're so against me and for everybody else that this guy is yeah. the virus that I need. I don't worship him as a cure. He's a virus, and I'm okay. going to inject him into the political corpus and make you motherfuckers sick. Okay. That's where so that, their heads are. I've met are. those people too. I've spoken to those people. It's interesting because you're dividing up the people now. So we're not talking about the people who turn up at the rallies and the red hats who say he's the king, the leader. We love Some him. of them do, lie. but I believe that they're supporting him the way I support the Jets. You know, that they, they are I, my I team. It, I get it. But you're, you're talking suck. about the people who say, look, we know he's a liar. We yes. know he's a bullshitter. Yes. But that's useful to us for whatever reason. So let's deal but with that in a couple game. of ways. So let me respond in two ways. Number one, that's why some of us supported Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020, because that anger is out there. It's bipartisan. It needs to be channeled in a fruitful way into reforming and, if necessarily, you know, reconstructing parts of our system, economic and political, right? I don't dispute the analysis that American politics is broken, that the economy doesn't work for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. I just think Bernie Sanders' populism, which is actually for the people, genuine, honest, actually for the little guy, rather than the false, fake populism of Donald Trump. So that's, so I, so in that sense, I'm with you. But here's where I differ from you all, from your, your friends. The problem is that we as a media especially media, have failed in outlining what is at stake and what is going on. So I, of course, look, I interview people for a living, Chris, as do you. You've seen me do interviews. I'm aggressive. I'm combative. I challenge people's lies. I'm not disputing the politicians lie, politicians bullshit, politicians, right? Of course, I just literally what I do for a living. But that's not the same as saying they're all the same. No, no one is like Donald Trump. No party is like the modern Republican party. I'm anti-conservatives, Chris. But the Conservative Party in the UK and the Conservative Party in France and the Conservative Party in Germany is not like the Republican Party in the US. I can deal with them. They're in a reality-based universe. I can have a good faith conversation with them. Not these guys, mm. not the MTGs, not the Mike Johnsons, no. So we need to be realistic about the fact that they're not all the same. If people say they're all the same, that's great. But we need to be able to inform and educate them as journalists to say, well, actually, no. What Donald Trump did in the pandemic was unique to Donald Trump. Right. Most Western leaders did not do, including conservative leaders, did not do what Donald Trump did on the pandemic or on vaccines or whatever else it is. And I think that's where, and by the way, the whole virus stuff, I heard that in 2016 and I gave it the benefit of the doubt. 
I can understand why someone votes for Trump in 2060. I don't agree with it, but Hillary's on the ballot, establishment, hawk, blah, 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 the Clinton name. Trump, he's going to shake things up, burn it all down. I get that in 2016, but you don't get to play that card in 2024, Chris, because we've seen him. He came into office. He gave tax cuts to millionaires. He deregulated for billionaires. He did not do anything to help the little guy. He screwed the healthcare system. He screwed over the coal miners. Sorry, you don't get to then come back and tell me this guy is the anti-establishment blue collar billionaire. Then you're just in a cult because we saw four years of Trump and he didn't do shit for the little guy. But they say the economy was better. The it's a lie. The border was not a nightmare. It's not true. I mean, and I can't deal with people's delusions. It's not, it's not true to say the economy is better. Well, depends on who and by what metrics you're looking at. I'm looking right? at the metric of four years. You know what the Trump people do? They stop in 2019. How convenient. Well, they stop with the pandemic because everything became artificial in terms but of how much money worse. was being Let's forced in. Let's not forget in. the pandemic. Um, I, don't, I, don't disagree. Other I don't disagree, although it seems like the left owns the pandemic. Again, uh, for whatever messaging yeah, I, I agree. reasons. Um, I agree. They screwed up. I get blamed for the pandemic more than uh, Donald Trump does. <laughs> I'm which, sure you get. I'm sure you get brother comments. Which is, and and some of it is because of Andrew, but oddly, I own a lot of it individually, which is uh, also always interesting to me. But unlike Mr. Trump, I have a genetic predisposition uh, towards the no fucks to give. You know, one of the reasons people will sometimes say, if they don't know me, if they know me. No one says this. No one who knows me has ever suggested I get involved in public service <laughs> in any way, anyone who knows me. But if they don't know me, they'll say, why, why don't you think about it? I have the opposite of what you need to be in public service, which Donald Trump has too much of, which is the desperation to please these people, have them love you and, and, and do things that are solicitous of that. However, I mean, he's one of the most loathed men in modern human history. So it is interesting, well on but it depends on by who, because, you know, boy, by the we majority get wrong, of human beings. Not we, because, you know, you, you, I don't lump you in with me. But the, in 2016, one of the things I definitely got wrong, although, although, I believed that he was going to win long before others and won many I got it wrong. I thought you really were so I was wrong on 2016. Um, but what I got wrong was how persuasive and powerful celebrity is in America. Yes. I didn't give it enough credit. Yes. Anyway, they look at this. They say policy for policy. I'm going with Trump, not because of that, Trump, despite well, Trump. Chris, They'll please, say, come on, nobody looks at policies. Trump voters are not sitting and comparing policies. They are owning the libs. This is pure that, culture That is wars. true. I'll give it to you as an and. And inflation wasn't the same at the grocery store and the gas pump. And that's the most important economic metric. Uh, people felt that feel test of how did you feel four years ago versus now? They felt like the economy well, was better. Well, four years ago today, we had an economy that was in the, in the ditch. We had hundreds of thousands of people dying from COVID. Right. I mean, this is whole four years ago. My former colleague, Chris Hayes, did a very good segment on this, that you can't do the four years ago because it puts you in the middle of the worst year in modern American history. That's true. So they pretend that Trump was only president from 2017 to 2019. Yes. And they give him a and pass even, for the, the pandemic. Way, even in 2017 to 2019, the unemployment rate's lower now. Most of the economic indicators are better now. That's just, those are just objective facts. And I don't even try and get bogged down too much in the economy. Chris, I disagree with a lot of my fellow leftists who talk about the importance of the economy. I actually think the economy is not that important. If you look at the polling again and again, it's informed by partisanship, Chris, stuff you hate, the two-party game. You look, I did this on my old show. You look at 2021, you look at the polling from when Biden becomes, there's literally a line graph. Overnight, Democrats say the economy is amazing and Republicans say it's bad. Yes, Overnight, it, it's the binary. Didn't change. It shifts it's like who's that. In the, it's who's in the overall. 100%. So forgive, so forgive me when I kind of have very skeptical it's 100%. position on people's polling. I, I'm fine with you about that, but you still got to take people where you find them, right? Uh, which is as obvious. Um, kind of. I don't have to accept people's delusions. If people tell me Biden won, didn't win the election, I don't No, no, no. I'm saying in terms position. of understanding their motivations, you have to take them where yeah. you find them. Yeah. I'm not sure everyone is honest about their motivations, to be honest. I think a lot of what drives Trump support is big bigotry, is racial resentment, is cultural resentment. You mentioned it earlier, white people are being replaced. This country doesn't look like what it used to look like. At MAGA, the whole concept of make America great again. Great when? Yeah. Give me I'm, the year listen, when I'm you totally think it was with great. You. And I remember Trump getting stumped on that question. Um, so I give you that. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from Prize Picks. Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with a reason 
three million members, okay? This is the real deal, the easiest, most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers, that's why I like it. Pick more or pick less than, you get two to six players that you watch through the stat projections, and if you're any good, the winnings just roll in. I love simple when it's matched with safe. You get quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Here's the deal. I'm afraid of being taken advantage of. I'm afraid that there's sharks there. I'm afraid that there's like a inside way to do this that I don't know because I'm just looking to find ways to make the game watching a little bit more exciting than just listening to my dopey pals. So Prize Picks checks those boxes for me. Go to prizepickscom CCP. Use the code CCP for a first deposit match up to a hundy. Again, go to prizepix.com slash CCP. Use the code CCP for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The Chris Cuomo Project is supported by Cozy Earth. Why? Because I like their sheets. That's why. A lot of people don't get a good night's sleep for a lot of reasons. One of the ones that you can control is bedding. One out of three of us report being sleep deprived. Okay, well, what is it? Well, there's stress, there's all, all kinds of things. But the wrong sheets can make you hot, can make you cold. I'm telling you, I don't even believe it either. But Cozy Earth sheets breathe. And here's what I love about them. Cozy Earth's best-selling sheet is a bamboo set, okay? Temperature regulating. Gets softer with every wash. I'm not kidding you, all right? Now, so if you go to CozyEarth.com and you enter the code, enter the code, Chris, and you can get up to 35% off your first order. CozyEarth.com, and the code is Chris. The Chris Cuomo Project is supported by All American Assets. Why? Well, because you need somebody to help you make the right decisions. Scary days in the stock market now. You know, we work hard for the money, but very often you're at a disadvantage, right? You got smarter people who do this for a living, trying to find a way to take advantage of people like us. Here's the good news. Investing in precious metals, never been easier, and can absolutely help in balancing a portfolio. In the last 20 years, gold is up 400%. In the same 20 years, what's the dollar done? It's lost about 60, 65% of its purchasing power. So where do you go? How do you buy gold? What am I gonna put it in my basement? You go to American Assets, all American Assets and you got a 401k from a previous employer, you got an IRA, you can just roll it over into physical gold and silver or buy gold and silver using cash by sending a check or wire. Check out All American Assets. They offer a wide selection of different commodities, gold and silver, all delivered right to your door in secure, discreet, fully insured packaging. Now is the opportune moment to start investing in precious metals, safeguarding your savings against these volatile markets. I do it. Don't miss out. Visit allamericanassets.com today to explore the diverse range of precious metals, including rounds, coins, bars, uh, and you can sign up for a free one on one gold IRA consultation, okay? It's time to turn your paper savings literally into gold. Visit allamericanassets.com or go and text GOLD, G-O-L-D, to 1-888-390-2522. Now I think there's a transcendent issue. And I didn't see it coming, by the way, um, because I had tired of the border. I am many years into covering it. I can't tell you how many times I have treated this as if it were new. I can't tell you how many coyotes I've been with. Sometimes I feel like, you know, hey, I better be careful about how much I say I know about the border. I may become, uh, you know, arrested at some point for uh, having too much knowledge of felonies. But the border has now become the top ticket item. And it happens to be the weakest issue for the Biden yeah. administration. Agreed. And it could beat him. And I think if it beats him, it's kind of his own fault on a policy level. What do you think of that? It's tricky because I come at it from a different perspective, which is I also think Biden's done badly on the border, but I, I think he's done badly on the border because he's appeased the right too much, which I know you won't agree with that. Our bright wingers will laugh at me for saying that. 
But even that border bill, the Senate bill, I think is a ridiculous bill. It didn't way even too have the power. dreamers in it. It also gives crazy powers to a secretary of to a secretary of Homeland Security, Stephen Miller. Right? I don't want to grant powers to an executive branch that may be run by Trump, Bannon, and Miller in a few months' time. So I just think that whole thing was wrong. Look, for me, the immigration stuff, it's it's unfashionable. It's not as sexy to point out, but it happens to be true, which is it is not just a demand issue, it's a supply issue until you deal with what's happening in those countries, in the triangle, on the ground. This will never be resolved. You think you can build your way out of this, build a border out of it? It's absurd. We but all they know say it was better under Trump, and now I don't feel just safe. Just not true. Again, okay, so again, not true. In the last year of Trump's presidency, again, they, they only say that, Chris, because they start at the clock in 2019. Go and look at 2020's figures. It was a constant upward direction in people coming across the border. And that's with uh, Section 28. That's with all the COVID rulings. So- just not true. Have a look at the numbers. It's just a lie to say it was better under Trump in 2020. There was less- true. Unless President Trump was not president in 2020, that is a lie. It was, there was absolutely what we saw, what I characterize, and I always say this, and yet people always say that I'm misquoting Trump. I'm not saying he said these words. I'm saying this was his characterization, the brown menace. When they started to come up in the spring uh, under a lot of enticements from a lot of big employers in the United States, that's the year that you're talking about where we saw a uh, number spike. He put a number of, and now I got to give him credit because it was on his watch, even though I really don't even believe he knew this was going on because I knew the people who designed the policies and they were not Trump people and they barely even talked to him even though they were in the administration. The home country agreements he did the symbolism of remain in Mexico, not the practical effect. Only yeah, 74,000 people horrific. went through uh, remain in Mexico. But also the, it led to a lot of rape and sexual violence, which Republicans claim to care about. Yes, uh, but selectively they care about it. Um, of those things and the Biden taking all of them out in one big sweep when he came in definitely led to a spike assisted by a messaging change. Agreed. There's no question that people believe that Democrats slash Joe Biden don't hate them the way Trump did. And when people are making the decision of the most dangerous decision of their lives to leave everything they know and trust terrible people and to do terrible yeah. things for a long time, they think about the chances of success. So I believe that if that border becomes the defining issue, you lose on the left. Which is why- which is why I don't think they should allow it to become the defining issue. That doesn't mean you try and propose draconian policies. I come from a different school of thought. As I said, I wrote a book about rhetoric. I don't believe that you take your opponent's most salient issue and lean into it. I think that's madness. Well, what do Republicans do? Do you think Republicans talk about healthcare all the time? Do you think Republicans sit around and go, wow, people really hate our healthcare policies. We should come up with healthcare policies and talk about it all the time. They don't. They just avoid talking about it, Chris. When was the last time a Republican told you their healthcare plan? Because they know they've got nothing and they know the Democrats need on healthcare, always have. I think it's madness for Joe Biden and the Democrats, if they do this over the next six months, to carry on talking about the border and say, we'll be tough on the border. And the Labour Party did this in the UK. My position is people don't vote for fascism light. They vote for fascism. They don't vote for they don't vote for the guy who meets you on the middle on border security. They meet go for the guy who goes all out. Right. Like there's no value to offering the light version of the Republican plan. You either do your own thing and stand up for it, or you just don't talk about it. And that sounds cynical, but that's the reality of politics. There are multiple issues that voters care about, and it's up to you as a politician to choose what you want to focus on. I think Democrats should lead into democracy and the threat to democracy, abortion rights, healthcare. These are, and of course, Trump's awfulness. I'm an ad hom guy. I think Biden should have been unloading on Trump long ago. He's come out very late out of the gate on Trump. They should have already gone after Trump. Uh, he's also not, he's also not People good at his best, and he's not at his best of making that kind of case. And he is a flawed individual, not on the scale of Trump. <laughs> Let me be very clear. I Nobody think Joe is Biden is a fundamentally uh, good man in my dealings. I feel the opposite about Trump. And while everybody's got to be open to voting for whoever's on the tickets in their own interest, Agreed. Uh, I don't tell you who to vote for. As I've said before, if Trump is depending on my vote to get into the White House, he's in a lot of trouble. Now, the foreign issue that they'll point to, which is very important to you, and I want to discuss it because I want the audience to understand uh, where you're coming from on these issues and how thoughtful you are on them. Whether they agree or not, Medi is thoughtful, and we need that. We need critical thinking. You don't have to agree, but you yeah, can't say you, you just made the shit up. So uh, right now, the state of play 
in the Middle East is that everybody knows it's an untenable situation, even within Israel. Yes, there's a lot of resentment. Yes, there's outrage and a lot of other negative motivators. But nobody wants to see the continuation of large-scale destruction of innocence. And that's what's going on. But how do you stop it? What is the mechanism that gives Israel the assurances it needs to stop going after Hamas and does that have to start with the return of the hostages? That's the only part I don't understand in the analysis is why does it always begin with Hamas? Give back the hostages. Give back the hostages. Then you have a modicum of leverage. You have to give back the hostages. But what is your take about how you get to better? Or just big less bad? Chris. Big, big questions, no easy answers. Um, I would question your premise that no one wants to see death and destruction in Gaza, actually, plenty of Israelis do, sadly, and that's what Israeli society has moved. It shifted a lot to the far right. Well, in plenty of years. extreme Muslims, including some of the leaders of Hamas, want to see it also because it works very well for their cause. Oh, agreed. There are extremists on both sides who want to see death and destruction. Uh, the extremists on the Palestinian side are not funded by the United States and protected at the UN Security Council by the United States. So there's a big difference between the government of Israel and Hamas. I, I'm always, I always enjoy this idea that Hamas is this ISIS-like terrorist group. But anytime you say anything about Israel, Hamas has brought forward some kind of benchmark. Why is Hamas the benchmark? I judge Israel as a government, as a democracy, as a member of the United Nations. So I hold it to that standard, not the Hamas standard. Um, look, this is the question since October 7th. Well, what is Israel supposed to do? How are you supposed to get security? Hamas will attack again. There is no short-term answer, Chris. I can't tell you that if there's a ceasefire tomorrow, there will never be another attack on Israel because I don't know what's going to happen in the long term. We can talk in short-termism. But this is a conflict that has gone on for 75 years or more. It's gone, it's, the occupation since 1967 has been going on for 57 years. Um, this doesn't get resolved overnight. But the reality is that you cannot continually, indefinitely hold Palestinians under occupation and say, well, we need security, right? The smart people in the Middle East on both sides know that the two go hand in hand. For security, you need freedom. For freedom, you need security. We all accept that. The reality is, though, that there are a bunch of people in the Israeli government and Israeli society who have never been interested in allowing Palestinians to be free. And look, it sounds cliched, it sounds naive, it sounds utopian, but actually some of Israel's top security people, Chris, say, unless we sort out the freedom situation, Israel won't be secure. Right. They say it. And I have one quote for you. I was already one yeah, quote they're just not in BB's Shlomo administration. Brock. Unfortunately, no, because they're they're they're... Uh, we've got lots of choice words for them. Shlomo Brom, former Israeli general, big strategist in the Israeli military, he said after October 7, it is absurd to hope that Israel can indefinitely contain with its military might millions of Palestinians who claim the right to self-determination and a free normal life. Eventually, the oppressed will rise against their oppressor. Now, if I said that, you're a Hamas apologist. I'm not saying it. Shlomo Brom right. says, but eventually, the oppressed will rise against yeah, the oppressor. Yeah, it's true. Until that dynamic exists... There is no hope in the middle. I, I totally Don't talk agree. Don't to me about two states and borders and terrorism. and but None of it matters until we deal with that. Yes, that dynamic although the it's hard to even get to the that when really, to be fair, Bibi Netanyahu doesn't believe in a two-state solution. No, he doesn't. Um, and by the way, right now, even, even let's take a step back. You said about hostages. Of course, the hostages should be free. They should never have been taken. It's a war crime to take hostages. Um, and I've seen the people who've been released, and a lot of those hostages family, by the way, Chris, they hate the Netanyahu administration because they want to right. ceasefire and a negotiated release. But put that to one side. We are now in mid-March, late March. Right. This is not October or November. We're in a situation now, Chris, where according to Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, everyone in Gaza, everyone, 100% of the population is now food insecure. Yes. Right? A quarter, half a million people at least are in a famine situation. Yes. We're now being told by the experts that it's not an impending famine, the famine's begun. Yes. Because the indicators are all lacking. I've heard the same thing. So we right now, we, I'm sorry, with the greatest respect to Israel's security needs, and I want those hostages to be released, but right now, millions of people are at risk of starving to death, and we are paying for it. We are complicit. For me, that's the only issue. That, that's what history will judge us on. In years to come, history will look back on this moment and see where people stood on the mass starvation of an innocent civilian right. population. That and it's the easiest part to fix. And I've talked about yes, this a lot the within easiest. the administration. Agreed. And, it, and it doesn't even require a ceasefire. But, I, and I remember this, you're too young, Mehdi. But I remember when we, after post 9-11 and all of us became, you know, not all of us, people became embeds and went over and started covering what was happening. It was, I had to be educated in 
All right, so you're going in there. I'm watching all the rules change in real time because we had these different rules of engagement that weren't for urban warfare and where everybody is weaponized. So I'm watching all the rules change. But every time they would blow up a community, right? And they were blowing up more and more communities as we were getting harder and harder fighters, right? Because that we weren't ready for that. There was so much aid, many. There was aid all over the place, constantly. And some of the guys would say, you'd hear like, boy, we're feeding these guys a lot so they can have the energy to try to kill us tomorrow. But it wasn't ever questioned. And that was the big mistake from the American perspective in the Middle East right now is that the aid should have always been maximized. And it was like- but Biden allows BB to walk all over him. It's yeah, you I talk agree, about Biden I agree the border, that there's a you, fundamental you, you say, problem there. You um, say the border will cost Democrats the election. My fear is that BB will cost Democrats the election because every leftist I know, every Muslim and Arab I know in Georgia- But how can they vote for Trump? And, and they, I, some of them are going to vote for Trump. 20% of Muslims voted for Trump in 2020. It's crazy, but they did. I don't agree with them, but they did. And more of them will vote for him next this time for precisely the reason you said earlier. Send him in to burn it all down. That's what I hear from a lot of people on the left and Muslims. Uh, and well, Muslims. let's see what so, happens my, when during the election. My Trump worry lets is, slip my worry that is he would the uncommitted vote. My worry is the young voters, the black voters, the social justice voters, the leftists, and the Muslims and Arab Americans. They don't show up because of BB, because of the humiliation of the United States on the international level. We are dropping aid while dropping, but while Israel drops our bombs. And then we're building a pier that's going to take months to right. set up because we can't drive our trucks across the border. Not because Russia is blocking us or North Korea is blocking right. us or Iran is blocking us. Our ally, the guys we give three and a half billion dollars a year to are blocking us. That's an embarrassment yeah. for the world's the, the, only the superpower. The aid doesn't work, but I still believe that just in basic, just basic logic, they have to be forced to give the hostages back. It changes the negotiation But who plan. is the they, Chris? That is Hamas. You and I don't control Hamas. The children starving to death in Gaza don't control Hamas. I mean, I'm sorry, if you talk about it in terms of Hamas, that is a definition of collective punishment, right? The people in Gaza cannot be held responsible for the crimes of Hamas. It's just as the people of Israel cannot be held responsible for the crimes of Netanyahu. We're going down a very dangerous road if that is how we establish all conflict. Because when I hear Israelis say, well, it's the fault of Hamas, that's exactly what Palestinians say when Israelis are killed. It's when it's the fault of the government, they are oppressing us. I don't think you should ever punish civilians, ever, on either side, but that anywhere is, in the world. Un unfortunately, it happens every time there is a war. Mehdi Hassan will give you food for your brain. You may not like the diet. But here's what we know for sure these days, no matter where you see yourself on the ideological spectrum, you need not just perception, you need perspective. Um, and perception is just like what you feel you come up with yourself. Perspective is ideas that inform your own. Mehdi Hassan is one of the best at that. Again, it's not about agreeing, although it's hard to disagree with a lot of what he says. It's about why you believe what you believe. Mehdi Hassan Zateo uh, of having critical looks at investigating, seeking for knowledge and perspective. I wish you every good fortune, and I think you deserve it. Chris, uh, that means a lot. I appreciate uh, your support. I appreciate the conversation. Uh, I think we agreed uh, more than uh, we disagreed, which is always a good thing. And uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug and say zeteo.com, Z-E-T-E-O.com. Check it out. Subscribe. The full launch is next month. Thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I hope you're having me back. I would love to have you on my platforms on a regular basis. Um, my audience can only benefit. There's an, and I'm easy pickings. Plenty I do is worthy of criticism. Mehdi Hassan, all great things for you to come to be continued. Cheers, Chris. Smart, smart matters. Too smart by half? Well, that takes us to a central proposition about the left. Do you win the argument but lose the election or the overall persuasion. You don't have to agree with Mehdi Hassan to respect his intellect and where he's coming from. It's authentic, okay? Yes, he's a debate champion, but he's not just doing this for academic purposes. It's not just an exercise. He believes too. So you can check out Zateo and see uh, if Mehdi Hassan adds to the nutritional value of your intellectual diet. Uh, I know I will be there for Zateo, even though I don't agree all the time. It's about understanding what else is out there in the marketplace of ideas. More ideas, not less. Thank you for subscribing, following, 
here and at the Substack, the Chris Cuomo Project.substack.com. And I'll see you at News Nation, 8 p. and 11 p. every weekday night. Good to have you there. Good to have you here. The challenges are real. So let's get after it.